Yes, okay, fantastic. So let's jump on in. So for those who are new to the Tech Forum, uh, we have uh, aligned on a number of different categories that we're watching on a monthly basis. Um, that are reflected here on this page. Um, COVID-19 is one that has come in, obviously, for um, you know, recent events um, that we've added, and you know, this is a very flexible uh, list. So if there is within the audience um, a particular category you want to add, please let us know. We're always, this is an evolving and adaptive um, forum to make, uh, to help with the, the collective audience in terms of the work that we're all doing to stay attuned to innovation that's out there. So I'm going to jump right into the first category, materials. So we've all heard about 3D printing and how awesome it is for a number of different uh, technologies and industries, um, particularly in the medical field. But there is a new type of uh, 3D printing. Now we have to think about different dimensions, now 4D printing. And what this is essentially uh, evolving is a uh, form factor that can evolve its shape uh, between two different, um, uh, very different forms. Um, and how this happens happens is a uh, 3D printed of a soft structure that can um, change back and forth between form A and form B based on external stimuli, um, particularly heat and or electric current. Um, the technique uh, involves one set of chemical links that establish an original form and then a second set of chemical combinations that are then through a combination of physical manipulation and UV curing then can transition between the two, two forms. And uh, the team at Rice University believe that they, this could be very helpful for adaptive biomedical implants to essentially better blend in with the soft tissue of the body uh, with causing less irritation or damage and potentially can offer more therapeutic functionality because they are more adaptive uh, to uh, the anatomical environment. And of course, there are many other potential uh, applications, but in terms of the medical, uh, that is one of them. Another type of uh, material in terms of its impact on the body is a wound sealing tape. Uh, MIT have uh, brought this one to light uh, through a lot of work that they've done. So of course, you know, how we adhere wounds to each other, the old fashioned way is with sutures and or even staplers um, in uh, more recent times. So this adhesive tape is actually allowing the sealing of internal wounds um, and also uh, the, able to, the ability to be able to remove that tape or adjust that tape um, to be a better version of a suture replacement. So this tape has been engineered with a disulfide linker molecule that enables the tape to be easily and painlessly detached by applying a liquid solution. Um, so in, essentially you're, you can, uh, you don't have, you're causing less uh, uh, damage to the tissue. Um, particularly as it's, as it's healing. You don't want to have to heal a wound and then rip off half of the layer of the skin, the new skin that's formed uh, through, the, uh, through a tape application. So this is very encouraging um, in terms of future applications for closing surgical, surgical wounds and helping wounds heal. Right, the next material moves into um, literally materials, fabrics. So we've all learned about in the past uh, smarter fabrics that have sensors embedded in them. The problem with all of these sensor-based materials is they require power. Well, this uh, team from Switzerland has developed a transmission line smart fabric that, in, um, that incorporates the idea of um, thin lines made of flexible, uh, stretchable elastomer uh, with a met two metal sublines in it. And at once, one end of the line uh, is attached to an electrical pulse that can be detected at the other end. And so when the body moves uh, wearing this fabric, um, the, the um, detection at the end can be sensed. And so when the line is stretched or compressed or twisted, the pulse um, that's uh, um, moved through the transmission line can be easily detected at a lower energy level than uh, some of the current sensors today, which have to be placed all around different parts of the body and maybe more sensors are needed um, and therefore uh, a higher cost uh, to generate that fabric. So this is an interesting application. Also thinking about fabrics and innovation, um, the, this Chinese team from Donghua University has developed 
a fabric that not only cools like our Nike Wick um, shirts that we're probably wearing today, but is also hydrophobic, so it's water repellent, and it can conduct heat away from the body. So this is a very multifunctional type of material. It's able to transfer uh, heat, wick away sweat, and also be water repellent. It's made from three different polymers, poly polyurethane, fluorinated polyurethane, which is the water repellent nature, and something called boron nitride nanosheets, which are the heat conductive uh, capability. There are large pores between these fibers that are actually woven together through an electro-spinning process. Um, and those large pores enable air to circulate to the skin, but also allows moisture to evaporate. Um, and not only is this uh, potentially an application for wearable fabrics, but it could actually help cool down electronics. Think about your laptop overheating, um, or even collect solar energy or desalinate uh, seawater um, because it's operating in the same way as taking sweat away from the body. So some really interesting applications coming out of, uh, out of this uh, development. Um, this material is a cardiovascular monitor that is self-powered as a wearable. Um, Purdue University have demonstrated that um, this uh, material called polyvinyl alcohol, which is a very common polymer used in biomedicines today, is actually able to produce a very efficient, highly sensitive triboelectric nanogenerator. And these can actually act as a self-powered cardio activity monitor because they can detect very, very small degrees of skin you know, deformation um, that would be, maybe would be caused by a pulse um, from the heartbeat. And, they, and uh, uh, these tangs, if you will, are able to capture cardiovascular data and encode it in, this is encoded in a pulse signal. So potentially just a simple application of something that feels like a, a Band-Aid could be um, as meaningful to uh, be able to measure heartbeat and um, cardiovascular health. Right, moving into more sensor-based uh, uh, innovation, the Cordio Hero, uh, designed from a team from uh, Israel, is um, attempting to, just with an app, able to detect the presence of heart failure. Pretty, pretty fascinating. So this, what this app does is it analyzes the user's voice to detect heart failure-related lung congestion. As you know, the lung, the lung fluid accumulates in the lungs. Obviously, it impacts shortness, uh, it impacts our breath and our ability to talk. So this app was tested on 40 patients who had been admitted to the hospital with known heart failure, and uh, each of these patients recorded five spoken sentences at the admission to the hospital, and then they were later discharged as just before they were discharged from the hospital, and presumably better. Um, they recorded five uh, the five same spoken sentences, and the app was able to correctly determine whether this individual had uh, was healthy or not. And they intend for this app to be prescribed for home use among patients with risk of heart failure. Uh, by establishing a baseline recording when the patient's healthy um, with prompts for daily new recordings, particularly for those people who are at risk. And of course, there's a doctor on the other end of that, uh, that app being able to analyze the information and make some uh, much more quicker decisions um, regarding that individual's healthcare. Just an app. <laughs> Do away with all the other devices. Okay, the next uh, sensor device is a patch um, that is intended for monitoring vitals um, and it incorporates uh, cloud storage and there's a physician app, a facing app uh, for remote, remote monitoring of multiple patients at, uh, at, at once. So in this adorable picture, you can see uh, the placement of the patches and the underarm of the, of the baby there. The patch is designed to be wireless, flexible and disposable after six days of wear. Um, tracking heart and respiration rates, uh, variability of heart rate, blood temp, and blood oxygenation. Um, it's compatible with uh, iOS and Android um, and enables instant notification of significant changes and shows trends over multiple days um, and can also be synced to uh, electronic health medical record. FDA approved as well, so it's already out in the marketplace. Um, the next sensor, also in the line of monitoring babies and mothers with babies uh, in the womb, this is an intrapartum fetal monitoring by, I love the name of this, Storks Technology, comes out of a startup from uh, UC Davis. This is an oximeter that is measuring blood oxygen levels non-invasively on an unborn fetus. So you think about that, how do you actually get to the 
get to the baby inside the belly without uh, making a cut of some kind. So obviously blood oxygen is really important uh, for all of us, but um, for babies, it's particularly important in the birthing process because if they lose a level of oxygen for a long period, so more than a good, <laughs> more than a very small amount of time, they get brain damage. So as clinicians, you definitely want to be able to monitor that. Currently, the, the traditional model is to be able to estimate it, guesstimate it from the fetal heart rate and contractions that are happening during birth, but it's not an exact uh, measurement. So this device is providing more granularity and accuracy by applying the device to the mother's abdomen and then shining a light through her skin and tissue. And then as the light is scattered back, uh, to the reader of the, um, of the device, the fetus blood oxygenation level can be distinguished from the mother, kind of like how a hearing aid, hearing aid is able to, um, some of the more sophisticated hearing aids is able to remove the noise from an ambient conversation that's happening outdoors to develop a more accurate reading, distinguishing it from the mother's. Pretty interesting. Sometimes we see a lot of products that are kind of similar to, similar to each other coming out in the public domain all at the same time because they're all trying to get into the patent land first. And this is, I think, one of them. So Philips um, has uh, come to market with CE approval in Europe um, for the Avalon fetal and maternal pod and patch system. So this enables remote clinicians to continuously monitor the heart rate and uterine actu activity, how much the mother is contracting, how often, of an expectant mother um, and the child uh, for a 48 hour period. Very useful during the birthing process. So maybe the mum can stay at home um, in some of the earlier contractions and not have to rush into hospital, particularly in the context of COVID. Um, folks really want to stay at home as long as possible. So the patch is placed on the belly by the mother. So it's designed to be very intuitive in terms of placement. Um, and uh, is, uh, is able to be effective uh, for uh, the parents to be able to have peace of mind uh, at the beginning of the birthing process. All right, moving into a different form of sensors, the finger track is a wearable bracelet uh, developed by Cornell University and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, it uses uh, a series of cameras to map the contours of the wrist, right? And just by looking at the contours of the wrist, can reconstruct the entire hand and where your uh, positions of your finger are. So it's projecting uh, or predicting where your fingers are based on uh, movements of the upper part of your hand. Um, it's a lightweight device um, and is able to um, uh, identify the 20 different finger joints relating to um, your fingers. And it generates a virtual model, as you can see on the Im images um, related on this page, uh, to produce actions, reproduce actions like opening a book or writing with a pen, um, or even using a phone. Um, the uh, team anticipates obviously this being useful for VR and gaming of various different kinds, but it also could support remote controlled robots, act as a sign language translator, and even track early signs of disease with evidence hand tremor like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Um, so really some very interesting uh, applications for this technology. Right, in a very, uh, if you see it, loose transition into robotics. Um, this is a humanoid hand um, that is trying to solve this kind of uh, discrepancy or kind of uh, di distinction between robots that hold a firm grip and robots that hold a soft grip. Um, there are two different types of robots in terms of uh, handling. Um, and there are very few, uh, very few uh, current innovations that, uh, that demonstrate a robot being able to do both. Um, so, and what, how this technology actually works is it, it uses four fingers and an opposable thumb, just like a human's uh, hand. And each of those fingers has a hybrid pneumatic, pneumatic actuator and a soft air bladder. The air is pumped in and out of the, uh, the bladders that enable the finger to open and close independently of each other and conform to different object contours. There's a spring, a leaf spring inside each finger that essentially acts as the bones of the hand and uh, that delivers a much more forcing uh, grasping force action. So in terms of applications for this uh, uh, innovation, um, Think fruit picking, you know, those soft fruits uh, like raspberries or strawberries and uh, could also be used for, in medical care and surgical applications uh, when you're dealing with various different types of um, bones and uh, soft tissue. 
Um, another softer robotic is the wireless aquatic robot uh, from a team in the Netherlands, an architect team in, in the Netherlands. This is inspired, and there's some lovely examples in the tech forums in the past of biomimicry, inspiring uh, new technologies. This, uh, this biomimicry is a coral polyp, uh, which together, as a, as a kind of team, if you will, band together to form coral reefs. And uh, they work together to generate small currents to attract food particles to them, and then they grab with their tentacles and they eat on, they eat upon. Um, and so this robot is intended to take take the, the in inspiration from this, um, is powered by magnets, yay magnets, um, and light uh, to grab and release objects underwater. Um, the robots are created out of a photomechanical polymer material that responds to different wave uh, wavelengths of light. So UV light, when, it's ex when they're exposed to it, uh, enables them to perform a grabbing motion, so closing up those arms. And a blue light causes a releasing action. Um, they anticipate uh, being able to use these aquatic robots to potentially clean up uh, the oceans, um, potentially removing oil from water for an oil from an oil spill, or using it just to clean water or even potentially transport cells through fluid. And when you think about cells through fluid, then, then that takes us into the body um, and potentially other applications as well. Essentially thinking about timed release of drugs uh, in the body, that might be one another application down the road. All right, there have been many robots that have been developed. You know, we know that Amazon is using robots in terms of their warehousing as an example. And this, is, uh, this robot was developed by um, the director of robotics at Google. He has left that company to start Hello Robot. Um, and this particular robot is uh, in, intended to assist with a wide variety of applications, including uh, folks who need help at home, uh, the elderly, of course, stocking a grocery shelf, like the, the GIF image that's shown here, as well as potentially wiping down infectious work surfaces, think in a COVID era where uh, we're trying to clean rooms really quickly, potentially. So the robot has a one meter uh, pole and a base and a telescoping arm, and it can move up and down uh, that pole. It also has a 3D camera and laser rangefinder, microphone and speaker array, so it can respond to requests uh, by a user. It's run on open source software and it has an electrical drive system and a multi wheel base that gives it a high degree of mobility, being able to move around in a very tight space. It's very expensive, um, $17,950, at least that's a large price tag for me, um, for a robot that I might have in my home. But compared to some of the other robots that are in the marketplace, it's actually pretty good value, apparently. Commercially available today. This next robot uh, also is a UV light uh, robot related robot called the Thorvald. It's kind of a cool name, uh, a partnership between Cornell, University of Florida, and Saga Robots that actually uh, built the thing. So mildew is a problem for crop farmers. Um, in particular, it's very, uh, it you know, damages crops and um, the fungicides that are available today are expensive and they're not really that great for the environment. Um, so come in from side entrance, uh, the DNA damaging UV light emitting robot is here to save, save the day. So this robot can be set up to autonomously move along roads of crop, crops at night, uh, eliminating mildew. So when we think about UV, at least I did, I think, well, UV is available in natural sunlight. Why doesn't, why does this robot do anything different? Well, in actual fact, fungi like mildews, they have a defense mechanism which is triggered by blue light that's available in sunlight, um, but it's not present in this robot's light. And so by removing, uh, just apply UV light and not U the blue light, like that uh, polyp that we were looking at earlier, um, the, the, the mildew or the fungi, it doesn't have its defense me mechanisms up. And so uh, this robot can actually be more effective to uh, address uh, those types of uh, diseases. It's in pilot in some vineyards in New York State. And it's really cheap, particularly compared to that $17,950 one um, for 70 bucks. Interesting. Okay, so uh, moving into diagnostic uh, devices, um, MRIs and PETs um, are able now to locate specific locations of pain, chronic pain, in the body. 
So you know, when we go into the, uh, the ho hospital and complain, oh my, you know, something hurts, I just uh, hurt all over. This can actually start to identify the real true source of pain in a patient and also visualize um, systemic burden of infl inflammatory arthritis. So you know, when you find that, you know, that people really aren't understanding or acknowledging the pain level of a patient, this can really start to make a difference. This system uses something called 18FFDG, and I didn't actually look up what that acronym stands for, a PET to detect increased glucose metabolism in tissue relating to pain. So where a, uh, an organ or a muscle has uh, a lot of pain associated with it, apparently there's glucose that's uh, metabolizing more in that area. And so this system can recognize that. In a study that they did with 65 patients who were suffering from chronic pain, um, this technology was able to zero in on the pain location in 58 of those subjects, and that actually resulted in better pain management therapy and, of course, better patient outcomes. Um, particularly very useful for um, the arthritic, um, where pain can really travel uh, across the body. Right, also staying in the field of imaging and diagnose, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, products, uh, this is in the, in the realm of um, the eye. So OCT, or optical coherence tomography, is an imaging tech that's often used by ophthalmologists to view um, various different layers of the cornea. And they do this to be able to count the nerves and cells and to um, see them and be, basically evaluate their health um, of those nerves and cells. So um, it's also used to uh, diagnose corneal conditions. But one issue with the OCT uh, technology and imaging is it's very difficult to obtain a sharp image, just like when we work with a camera. Um, we're looking at a curved surface. Where does your focus uh, start and stop? Um, and you know, obviously the cornea is a curved surface, so it's very difficult to um, see, see, uh, see a large field um, using kind of flat camera technology. So this new OCT imaging um, produces a high resolution, very focused images by using a curved lens that flattens the corneal image so that more of it appears in focus as you can see from the images on the page comparing curved field versus field OCT. Next diagnostic, also kind of in the optical space, but now inside the body, this is a nano optical probe that is the thickness of a human hair. And that allows it to travel in the body, being able to map visually our blood vessels at a 3D scan level. So it potentially could even get into the cochlea of the ear and travel through various parts of our nervous system. So we could actually start mapping our bodies at a vas vascular level. Pretty mind blowing, actually. This is one of the ones I was like, <laughs> so this is a fine, fine optical fiber of 0.02 inches. Um, it has a 3D side facing lens printed onto it, micro printed onto it. And that opti optical fiber is then connected to a, 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 a depth sensitive OCT scanner as a flexible probe. Uh, it uses near infrared light, light to penetrate into the tissue and measure wave interference to build live 3D images. The probe can be rotated and pulled back slowly to scan a um, you know, particular vein, looking for plaque, for example. Um, uh, so really some very interesting applications for where I could see this um, being realized commercially. It comes from a collaboration between Australia and uh, Stuttgart University in Germany. Staying in the realm of blood, a portable blood ammo uh, ammonia detector uh, com coming out of Stanford University um, is important for those people who need to monitor their blood ammonia levels. Think people with liver disease, renal disease. Um, you know, blood ammonia is a byproduct of the digestive process and uh, the liver in particular is very important in this realm because it converts that blood ammonia into urea, which then leaves the body of course as urine. If left untreated, these high levels of ammonia um, accumulate in the bloodstream and can cause things like brain damage and other physical issues. Um, the testing process for detecting high levels of blood ammonia um, are limited in it involves cold storage um, delivery of the sample to a lab, is then centrifuged and run through an assay, and that typically takes about two hours. If you think about a young child um, or someone with you know, a very small amount of volume um, and a high level of blood ammonia, that can be a really critical thing that you want to try and uh, test for very quickly. So this portable blood ammonia detector delivers results in less than one minute 
using a single drop of blood on a custom test strip. We're seeing a lot of these kind of very quick, uh, faster reacting um, tests on a strip, um, kind of uh, detecting detectors and working quite a lot in this space uh, from our own diagnostic work. Right. I have to do a kind of shout out praiseworthy thing for Elon Musk. Um, if you didn't see this in the press uh, from a few weeks ago, um, I can give you the, the sound bite for it. Um, this is from a company called Neuralink, which is a, a one of Elon Musk's um, spin out uh, venture, venture things. He describes this as a Fitbit for your skull. It's coin, a coin size implant that is essentially a deep brain stimulator. It has very, 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 very small wires um, and is meant to be embedded into the cortical surface of the brain. Uh, Musk claims that this will be an outpatient robotic procedure that will take less than an hour without anesthesia. Uh, um, maybe I'll wait. And is able to continuously record uh, 1,024 channels of neural signals at the same time. Uh, there's a replaceable battery that lasts for one day. Not really spelled out whether that means I have to replace it for every day to go back in and to get a robotic procedure on a daily basis as part of my morning regimen. But anyway, the six axis inertia measurement unit tracks your head position and your movements. Um, other sensors also track temperature and pressure. Um, and there's an antenna that connects to an app, of course, because uh, you need that to be able to collect all of that data that the neural signals are signaling. But the whole point of this is it can record your memories. Essentially, that's the cell. And they are intending to uh, first address this for a spine and uh, spinal patients, um, thinking about uh, brain issues such as memory loss and blindness and paralysis. Um, and uh, Elon Musk anticipates that this might be used to treat for autism and even uh, improve non-linguistic communication, so some form of tele telepathy. He also joked that it could also be used to um, uh, gamble because now you can memorize more things that your eyes are being put in front of. They got FDA approval for a breakthrough device designation and they're starting clinical trials with spinal cord injury injured patients. This is another wow. All right, uh, staying in the kind of headspace here now in the therapy devices uh, world, uh, Calibri Microscope ENT Scope um, by a company in Israel is a lightweight device that has built in suction with a two millimeter tip. This is very practical as a solution because um, currently in order to perform these types of procedures in the ear, um, today involves a very heavy endoscope that has to integrate with the various different um, uh, instruments that you want to use and those endoscopes are heavy, they're hard to stabilize in the hand and so an autologist actually has to hold, hold things in a really awkward way and so the Calibri is actually enabling a much more comfortable hand position, a faster surgery, ability to perform this procedure with two hands without an assistant uh, uh, supporting the case. So a lot more efficient as a process. Um, it's one of those things that is like, a, yes, of course, go do that, make that commercial and they've gotten the FDA approval um, to market in the US. This one is a, a, a personal favorite of, of mine. If, you've, if you have a dog, you will know the benefits of this particular movement of rubbing up behind the ears and massaging the dog in the dog's kind of top of his head. Well, this neck, brain, neck band does that for humans. This is a stress reducing device that works the mastoid and the temporal bones in the skull to stimulate posterior insular cortex part of the brain. A 20 minute session that can be done whilst I'm talking to you here um, has some very tangible benefits based on the study that Fillmore Labs did that showed that 90% of their subjects experienced a significant reduction in stress and improved sleep quality by 50%. There's a paired app, of course, that tracks usage and it, uh, it has a significant impact on stress and sleep. They are launching uh, <laughs> this fall, so I might have this one on my Christmas list, I have to admit. <laughs> All right, moving into drug delivery, the MSC microneedle patch, uh, MSC stands for mesenchymal stem cells, and there's always one word I can't pronounce in these things. Um, it delivers these stem cells into the skin to help with wound healing and tissue regeneration. Um, there are biodegradable needles uh, contained in a gelatin mix that holds uh, these stem cells. And when applied to the skin, the needles obviously attach and then stay in the skin tissue. Um, the outer shell of the needle dissolves over time and um, it allows the stem cells to move into the surrounding tissue. This is unique because this is an interesting way, a new novel way of getting stem cells into the body um, to help critically with wound healing. 
a very similar application, um, but for a very different indication, chemo silicon nano needle patch. This is delivering chemotherapy into a melanoma tumor painlessly without exposing the whole body to the chemo, uh, chemo treatment. So very, you can immediately see the, the direct benefits of this product. So it's a fully dissolvable patch substrate that's been fully miniaturized uh, with uh, silicon needles um, that have designed to have very angular tips that effectively penetrate into the skin. Once embedded in the melanoma, the chemo agent is released over several months as the needles dissolve and the silicone wrapping, if you will, dissolve inside the tissue. Pretty simple, but uh, very effective. Uh, this one made me chuckle as well, the humanoid chewing robot. So gum is actually a really neat way to deliver drug um, because uh, it is able to slowly deliver a controlled dose of a drug over you know, a period of time. The problem is there's not really an easy way to test um, the effectiveness of a drug in its uh, slow release application introducing the humanoid chewing robot that now allows for pharmaceutical uh, companies to test um, this, uh, this uh, media, if you will, of chewing gum um, for their particular drugs. And so this robot has been examining how to standardize a chew test um, to investigate the medium quantitatively. Uh, the robot has a, a human-sized mechanical jaws that replicate the chewing motion and also secretes artificial saliva as it chews, which breaks down um, the materials or the, the agents in the gum. And in a study that they did comparing uh, the robot with actual humans uh, chewing a, a xylitol sweetened gum for 20 minutes, um, tests were taken every five minutes to evaluate how much of the xylitol had been released, and they found that it was comparative. Um, so this robot is set, ready to uh, perform some clinical trials on our behalf. <laughs> Great. Another drug delivery uh, product, um, this uh, in a very different space, this is an, called the Algae Grower, developed in partnership between an Italian uh, inventor at uh, Polonisso de, di Tori, Torino and uh, curiously how they ever met, the Tsinghua University in Beijing. So what this product does is enables you to grow spirulina, which is a non-toxic blue-green algae at home. Apparently, this stuff is very good for you. Although when I look on the byproduct or the biomass that's generated on the right hand side, I'm like, maybe tomorrow I'll get my fix of spir spirulina. But how this device works is it's a 40 liter tank that's loaded with the starting, if you will, product, just kind of like sourdough uh, bread, if you will, um, and there's fresh water that's added. And the system's able to produce um, an average of five grams of edible biomass each day after a week of a, um, festering, if you will. Um, it's designed as a home appliance and to fit on your kitchen counter. Definitely a point of conversation when you have friends over. Um, it uses a photobioreactor process to provo provide the culture with light and heat and air, kind of like our sourdough uh, yeast starters. And when it's ready to be eaten, the spirulina is collected from a small drawer at the base uh, of the unit. Um, and of course, fresh spirulina, if you are curious, is really good apparently when you add it to yogurt or even pasta dough or bread. All right, uh, moving into the disability space. Um, this one is a really cool technology. The Thea by Loughborough University in England um, is a digital guide dog in the form of a handheld instrument. So obviously guide dogs are great for the blind, but they involve a tremendous amount of training. And of course, blind people have a pretty challenging time managing owning a dog. Um, it's not one of the easiest thing, one of the more easier things for them to do. So this is a handheld concept designed to replicate the same tasks as a, a guide dog. It uses a gyroscope to put the user in the correct direction. It follows a mapping system uh, that considers both the ease and safety of the path ahead for the user. It's designed to be hyper-intuitive um, and integrates or will integrate uh, laser-based distance measuring, mapping, and guidance capabilities. It's in very early development um, at the moment uh, from this academic team. Another disability also for the blind is the Hapti Reed um, coming out of this, this German uh, university. <clears throat> um, it enables people who rely on Braille to, to read, to be able to read public signs in midair. <laughs> the haptic feedback system that uses ultrasound pulses in precise patterns to produce Braille text in midair. The system uh, has a panel of 256 ultrasound transducers that, that emit frequencies of up to 200 Hertz, which are strong enough to be felt on the skin. 
Um, a depth sensing camera directs the ultrasonic points to the user's hands, and the system was tested on both sighted and blind people, um, asking to identify presented characters, and they were able to do so with a high degree of accuracy. Uh, moving into more of the physical um, uh, walking and ambulatory aspects of disability, this spring cam ankle foot orthosis uh, from a Japanese academic team is trying to help stroke vi victims um, better gain their correct walking gait. Um, particularly stroke vi victims um, have challenges with bending their knees far enough to be able to lift the foot off the floor so it doesn't drag on the ground. Um, and then that drag, of course, causes uh, that patient to stumble and then, you know, they have other issues. Um, so this is a lightweight device designed to be worn around the ankle. And as the patient steps forward, a cam, um, an elliptical cam, essentially rolls against uh, a device, um, rolls a device um, against a coil spring. And as that spring is released, the weight of the leg is, uh, as the weight of the leg is moving forward, the spring pushes the heel up and bends the knee. So it essentially teaches the knee to uh, relearn its muscles, um, particularly in terms of flexing. Um, and read about muscle memory for propagation. And some of the tests that they've done, uh, they found that these stroke the victims are able to recover faster as a result in rehab. Uh, similarly, the, the next stride by the Oro devices um, is trying to address the challenges of gait freeze. Um, this is a common issue experienced by those folks with advanced stages of Parkinson's, uh, where they essentially lose their ability to step forward. It's kind of a, a combination between a mental block um, and not knowing what to do with their foot at a certain point. And it often, with this gait freeze, often causes a loss of balance and, of course, a fall. So it's a very simple device in terms of its theory. It's um, a mounted on a walking aid of some form, whether it's a cane or a walker or poles, and it um, has an audible tempo electric metronome that sets a walking rhythm to encourage forward movement. And there's a downward facing laser that projects a green line on the floor so that uh, folks have a target for their feet. Um, so if you kind of have the combination of the rhythm uh, with a visual, um, you can uh, essentially potentially improve uh, the, the gate freeze issue at $600 commercially available today. All right, moving into COVID. There is now a breathalyzer that potentially can detect for COVID from Ohio State University. So uh, breathalyzers have actually been able to do a lot more than just test for alcohol. Um, we've seen breathalyzers that test for marijuana in recent um, uh, tech forums. This one is able to uh, de detect the metabolites relating to COVID infection. Um, and the, the results are available in 15 seconds. Forget waiting seven or 14 or 21 days for your test results. Um, and the way that they are presenting the results doesn't require any interpretation. It's very binary. It's designed to be low cost and user friendly. Um, and what, uh, the, what the device is doing is trapping and measuring and detecting nitric oxide and uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs in the breath. Um, it, by being available in 15 seconds and without requiring that interpretation, um, it, this could be a real game changer in terms of how we are able to uh, properly solve this pandemic. <clears throat> There have been quite a few masks, face masks, innovations that have come out of uh, COVID. Um, uh, this one is uh, another, another one worth of highlighting. So MIT and Brigham, in a collaboration, have tried to solve for the fact that N95 masks, which are the gold standard for uh, protecting our healthcare workers, um, are, have been very difficult to re-sterilize or reuse. And so they looked at alternative materials, thinking about a silicon rubber in particular, um, that can be uh, sterilized in a variety of different ways. So it's not dependent on um, the hospital having one particular type of application. So uh, this particular, uh, these particular materials that they've chosen could work in a steam sterilization oven, um, alcohol, or even uh, bleach soaks. Um, it's produced by uh, injection molding, um, and there are uh, two kind of pockets in the device that where filters can be placed in and removed. Um, they've gone through some fit tests and it's found to be as comfortable, which probably is a low bar for standard uh, compared to standard N95 masks. One question I have about silicone, though, is that it would be likely to cause more sweating um, around the face given the, the breathability um, of it. So uh, to be watched for future success. This mask um, called Hello Mask uh, by HM Care comes out of a team in Switzerland, um, is a transparent bio-based degradable surgical mask 
using electro spinning, um, something that we talked about before in some of the materials from previous uh, uh, previous uh, submissions here, um, that produces a porous semi-transparent material from polymer fibers. The fibers are 100 nanometers apart, which is small enough to filter those nasty bugs, um, but large enough to be able to breathe through. Um, they have been able to meet the class one medical device categorization in the EU. Um, and so they expect to be selling it to the medical community first. They secured a bunch of money um, to get it to market as, as soon as um, early uh, next year. So in the COVID space, um, there's this challenge, particularly for healthcare workers. I've heard quite a few stories of your know, folks coming uh, home from the hospital and not wanting to bring in the fabrics that they wear into their home to further increase the, uh, the exposure of virus. Um, there are a couple of products that uh, we're featuring uh, in this tech forum that are trying to solve for that. The air dresser by Samsung and a very similar product from uh, an Italian designer called Pura Case are attempting to provide a way to disinfect clothes. Um, the air dresser, um, it was initially introduced in Europe as a at-home dry cleaner and has been nicely repurposed for as a viral killing wardrobe, but <laughs> took that one off the list. Um, the, uh, Samsung claims the device can eliminate 99.9% .9 of bacteria on any type of clothing or fabric. So throw in the sheets, throw in you know, the duvet, throw in the dog bed covers, all the rest of it. The Pure Case prototype also uh, uses a separate kind of technology to, um, to use ozone to sanitize a fabric in a one hour purification process. Both are commercially available. Um, I didn't put the price points down here, but they're not cheap. Um, Ford is getting into the COVID uh, space. Um, they have introduced into their cars with a software update, a sanitation mode that disinfects uh, car interiors. Um, and how this works is the car interior temperature is uh, raised to 133 degrees for 15 minutes, presumably no human is sitting in that. Um, otherwise they would probably die. And that uh, temperature and that time period is sufficient to eliminate the COVID uh, virus in tests conducted by Ohio State. Um, New York Police Department is, has is using this feature in all 9,000 of their vehicles um, in fleet already. Um, okay, moving into the other category, there's always a couple that are just kind of in so interesting in terms of they're not really medical, they're, they're not medical devices, but they, there's something about them that is, you know, bringing something new to the table in terms of a conversational dialogue about what technology can be. The light boxer, so we all know about our pelotons and our, you know, um, uh, our elliptical machines. Well, the light boxer is introducing programs, tailored boxing programs for um, across all user levels using this thumping pad with light and music and force sensors um, so that the user can be guided to where to punch and to uh, the sensors embedded in the, mach uh, the machine to impact, measure impact and accuracy of that punch. And music offers a way to kind of choreograph to a rhythm to kind of enable a kind of a fitness uh, workout, if you will. Progress can be tracked on an app. And there's also a community leadership board where you can engage in remote, remote dual talent challenges with your neighbors um, at uh, a starting cost of uh, uh, 1495 bucks. Uh, there's also a monthly subscription, so you can, just like the Peloton model, um, you can engage in classes and uh, community activities with this. Available for pre-order at the moment. Okay. This one probably has a lot of guys or girls who are into <laughs> remodeling, which is probably a lot of you, really excited. I know my husband would be like, can I have this one for Christmas? This is an X drill by Robox. It's a power drill that has a UI in it. Um, so of course this drill has the interchangeable bits and the forward and backward drilling. Oh, that's boring now. But it also has this rear touch screen and that UI allows the user to drill a bit at a horizontal level and know that they're facing straight ahead. The display can enable the user to set and record an angle for a slanted hole and then copy that same angle for other holes that you're drilling into whatever material you're using. You can preset hole depths and there's a range finding laser so the drill bit stops when you reach the desired depths. Um, material selections such as wood and plastic and metal can be selected to determine optimal speed and torque. <laughs> to see it like my husband going whack. Um, this uh, app is, uh, also allows the user to save measurements and even find the drill if it's missing, just like our smartphone and lock it if it's stolen. Um, the battery lasts for two to three hours of typical use and it's available now through a kickstarting funding, funding campaign for $442. 
in the context of saving the environment, uh, the carbon neutral fuels um, uh, by Prometheus, um, which has been uh, partly funded by BMW iVentures, um, is a startup working to pull CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere and process it into a carbon neutral gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. If they can make it happen, it would be freaking awesome. So this Prometheus gas is designed to work seamlessly with all types of existing internal combustion engines. So no having to adapt the car to be able to incorporate this uh, fuel. Of course, they've got a lot of work to get to do and a lot of capital investment in order to be able to uh, make this happen. But this is very exciting. There's environmentalists out there. Okay, there's, I think, one or two um, I, Technologies uh, left, and then we'll open up for questions and commentary. Um, Virgin Atlantic is always pushing the envelope, just like Elon Musk. And I just had to feature this one for all of the interior designers out there, um, as well as to inform what our future kind of hospital spaces might look like. The VSS Unity Cabin interior um, is uh, uh, they. What Virgin Atlantic have done has released what their plan is for their first spaceship and what it's going to be like to be a passenger on board. And of course, you know, these are these seats on these flights are not going to be cheap. So it's got to be high style and high comfort. So the cabin interior has 17 fitted windows on the upper sides and on the roof. Passengers at the start of the experience on the trip will be buckled into these custom designed seats made of aluminum and carbon fiber and engineered foam. It's been developed by Under Armour, so it's really easy. You're wicking away your sweat, it's your sweaty buckets going through G Force. Um, and the positions of the chairs are controlled by the pilot to ease physical stress. Our uh, resident uh, physical therapist, Julia Hines, will give a thumbs up for that. And um, when the spacecraft achieves weightlessness, um, obviously, you unbuckle as a passenger and the seat reclines so that the maximum amount of cabin space can be, uh, could be achieved and you can float around and look through all the windows. Each seat has a digital display that um, shows flight data that the pilots are seeing. And there's even 16 interior cameras to capture the experience for you as a passenger so you can share it on social media. And there's a large circuit in there that lets people watch themselves up in space. Oh, it's just, it's just glorious. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so this can also be experienced down here on the real world through a free augmented reality smartphone app. Great sales tool. Um, and a great example of um, uh, if you are listening, Brian, more immersive product experience selling. So of, of course, this is really quite out there and that's why it ends up in the her category. But this is real. This is happening. Um, in our future at Sunday in the future. So um, our next tech forum is on the 21st of October. Please join in, please send me submissions. I love getting submissions um, and incorporating them. Um, so I will, uh, there's some links for those of us who are involved in putting this uh, presentation together. Please share out questions. We've got a few minutes to do so. I did see there were quite a lot of comments that were coming in. Didn't capture them, but no, but I want that drill. <laughs> so, if you buy you one for your husband, one. can you get one for me? <laughs> <laughs> I think there might be a waiting, uh, a waiting, uh, waiting line for that one. I like Stanley's idea that um, you could not we could nominate you for the next home shopping network of medical devices. Yeah, great job, <laughs> Jessica. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, dear, it cracks me up sometimes. <laughs> Jessica, do you work with all of this? equipment that you're discussing? No, I, they don't send me freebies in advance. <laughs> so I can trial and you know, have sponsored on my social media pages. No, um, I wish that was the case. That would be a lot of fun. It's just the way it rolls off your tongue. I know some of it you're reading, but it really was impressive. It was almost like you had a knowledge of each device. Oh, well, that's, that's part of the homework I do to understand what each of these technologies are. I mean, it's, it's definitely a, um, the reason why Zymedica does this forum is because when we go into ideations um, for, you know, coming up with new ideas or uh, new ways to solve a problem, so there's so much inspiration out there um, that uh, we can draw on and, you know, just staying ahead of these, uh, these products um, is useful. As, as you look at all this stuff and over the you know the years that, that we've been doing this what what is the sort of overarching trend that, or what are the overarching trends that you see in why this technology is developing rather than what it is i mean what what's driving a lot of this 
Whoa. I meant to answer that in the couple of seconds we have left. Um, wow, you could have next time. You could have lobbed that one to me beforehand, Aiden. I could have prepared a better answer Sorry. for you. That's okay. Um, there are definitely some themes and patterns um, across all of these tech, all of these tech forms. So we've been looking at uh, we've been kind of pub publishing these tech forms for six years now, <coughs> um, and I I definitely see building on technologies. So you know the idea of okay, there's a sensor that does this, and um, the increasingly how academic teams are particularly communicating in their messaging of what their technology is, um, showing applications in industry. Um, I'm seeing that a lot more now than I, I used to, which is like, we have this cool widget, don't you think it's cool too? It's like, no, take it, take it the next next step further. I'm seeing that more. You know, I, it just, it seems, it seems that, that there are themes on the, on the diagnostic side that there has to be a rationale as to why we'd want to, I mean, and like you said, we've seen a lot of fetal monitors. Why, why are we seeing those? What's the, what's, what is the core indication that's being chased down there? Sure. Um, what's the money be behind it and so forth? Um, you know, yeah, at, and, at, at a macro, at a macro level, there are abundance of themes, you know, keeping people at home for as long as possible uh, before bringing them into the hospital, particularly in the COVID universe where, you know, the acknowledgement is you come into a, a very infectious space, the, high, the likelihood of you getting more infected, you want to try and mitigate or reduce that. Um, the idea in terms of the diagnostic space of faster, cheaper, better, more accurate is definitely a driving force and has been for many, many years. The personalization um, and, and that. Yep, absolutely. And Anne has, yeah, a, I, has a question about the, the emergence of femtech, which you and I have been involved in for a very long time. <laughs> What is the Aiden, question? You can't, you can't just drop that term and not explain explain a little bit more to the broader mm -hmm. audience. So Jessica, Jessica and, and, and a team led a team uh, that I was involved in at, at Zymedica, which was uh, all uh, from uh, through Kimberly Clark. And so Femtech um, are technologies that are um, essentially focused on uh, female specific uh, indications of, of many, many uh, sorts. And at one point, I think we were looking, we were doing five different projects, all chasing the same exact indication in different ways. Wow. So, do you see any more on that, Jess? Um, certainly. I mean, the, the maternity fetal monitoring is just one example that, uh, of that. But, you know, many of the, you know, industrial design, uh, design products that you know, came out of the 60s, you know, from as early as the 1960s, uh, you know, up through the 1990s, um, really didn't consider women. Um, women weren't surgeons. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the design of the 95th percentile or 99th percentile was only really half the population. So increasingly we're seeing more uh, women being considered in terms of human factors um, in, uh, in the consideration of what a design is and isn't in terms of the specifications for it. Well, thank you. It was another um, extremely interesting MedTech forum. Yay! And